It is a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing my buddy for probably 30 years, Richard Lett. How are you doing, Richard? I'm doing fine, Howard. Thanks. I, uh, I, it, it, you know, I was looking back in preparation for talking with you. I pulled out that uh, one of your early um, Foran reports where you interviewed me, and that was 1995. So you're looking at 30 years. My, my gosh, that was. That was a long time ago. That was funny. We started that newsletter in 94. Yeah. Not not knowing the uh, the internet was going to come out. Then in 98, the internet came out, and I said, it's no longer me sending you a letter. Now it's interactive. So I took my name off, the friend report, made it dental town. Sure. And, uh, man. And, uh, and now who would have guessed that the internet would have jumped into the phone, and then podcasts come out, and now I'm podcasting you on Skype, and they're watching it in Kathmandu. How cool is that? That's cool. Here we are 30 years later, and... I'm still looking at that report, and everything we talked about at that time, unfortunately, is still true. <laughs> we'll talk about that during the podcast. You know, oh, you're the uh, you're the most beautiful bald dentist out there, and I'm uh, you're the most beautiful bald interviewer I've ever interviewed with. You know, it's funny when, he, when I got on, he said uh, you forgot to shave, and the only reason I stopped shaving is because I shaved my whole head every morning for so many years. I was just curious what the hell I was shaving off, so I haven't shaved for two weeks. And that's why I have this facial fungus. Just in case there's one, one person in Shenzhen who doesn't know who you are, I'll read your bio. Dr. Richard Litt received his DDS degree from University of Detroit in 1965 and his master's degree in certificate in orthodontics from Northwestern University in 69. Dr. Litt was professor and chairman of the Department of Orthodontics at the University of Detroit from 69 to 1980 and clinical professor and director of postdoctoral orthodontics at the University of California, San Francisco from 80 to 86. Dr. Litt is a member of the American Association of Orthodontists as well as many other groups. He has published numerous articles and is recognized one of the most dynamic educators in orthodontics today. He was a member of the European Orthodontic Society, the Society de Orthopedia Dento Dento Facial in France, the Edward Engel Society of Orthodontists. He was the orthodontist consultant to the Cleft Palate Center at Children's Hospital of Michigan and the Director of Orthodontics for Pediatric Dental Residency Programs. Dr. Litt started FORCE in 1985. FORCE is the first and only extended continued education program in orthodontics patterned after a graduate school education and presented by a qualified credentialed specialist with both clinical and university experience. FORCE was designed to educate the practitioner who wants to add orthodontics to his or her practice or expand their present orthodontic service to the next level. You are the, the most world esteemed orthodontic educator uh, period. I mean, I, I I don't know who I don't know who would be second. I mean, it, it's just you. I mean, you you, you ran the ortho department for um, two different universities in uh, San Fran and Detroit, and I took your course back in the 80s, and then I think I took it again in the 90s, and uh, I sent a bunch of bunch of my friends your way, and ev- ev- I mean every I mean you're just the man, Richard. How are you doing? Well, thank you, Howard. Thanks for that. You know. It- Every one of us has a place, and I decided a long time ago that if I was going to be the me, the man, as you call it, or if I was going to be my place, it was going to be in the area of uh, orthodontic education for the general practitioner. And that's really uh, pretty much the unique, most unique part of my, of my professional life. Once I left the university uh, in 1987, I left UC San Francisco, and I decided that somebody needed to teach the general practitioners in a pediatric dentist orthodontist the way an orthodontist does it. So I spent the last... 30-some years of my career doing that. As you said, we did a couple of courses in Phoenix. Uh, you did send a lot of people to me, and hopefully they're all doing well and enjoying the things they learn and making a good living and serving their patients well. But that's really where I pointed my interest. After I left the academia and left the university, university in 1986, I spent most of my career trying to educate pediatric dentists to the standard of care that orthodontic education deserves. Richard, um, you know, I call my program Dentistry Uncensored uh, because uh, it just is, and I like to talk about the 4,000-pound elephant in the room. I, I, want to, I want to start with something that um, everybody gets mad at me when I talk about, but I just want to just throw it out there. Into, it seems like there's nine specialties in dentistry, and eight of them, like, like say the endodontist, he'll, he'll help you do anything you want to ask him in endo because he knows you're going to do the incisors and you're not going to retreat molars. Um, the oral surgeon will help you do anything with an extraction because he knows you're going to send them, you know, wisdom teeth. But it seems like the orthodontists do not want to help any general dental dentist. They just say, you just send it all to me, and I'm not going to help you from Invisalign to a class one molar. Do you, do you, am I just sensing that, or do you sense that too? No, I, I think it's probably 
It's changed a lot in the last 30 years, but nowhere near to where it should be and no 100% agreement with you. And that's one of the reasons I decided to do what I was doing. But as long as you raise that question, and it is the elephant in the room. For the first probably 15 years that I was doing this, I was, and frank, frankly, ostracized by a lot of the orthodontists. They still didn't believe that Dude, an you were blackballed. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. They didn't believe that an orthodontist from within the fraternity should be out there teaching general dentists. And people would come to me, actually. They wouldn't come to me. They'd bump into me accidentally because... I literally remember walking down the street and seeing friends who used to be my friends and played golf with and was on the faculty with them. And they'd cross over the other side of the street because I, I was teaching general dentist orthodontics. And uh, that, that, you know, that was kind of a personal thing. But the reality of it was that when someone says to me, well, you're teaching general, ortho, ortho, general dentist orthodontics, and they did it with a kind of a, it didn't have a nice tone to it. It was a critical tone. My answer was, who do you think I was teaching at the university? Those were general dentists. There just were 10 of them at a time. Now, the difference is I'm teaching 50 at a time. So the idea of teaching general dentists is okay in the orthodontist mind as long as we maintain a small, small number of, ortho, of, of, of people that we're training and putting out there in a competitive environment. I understand the business side of it, but when I started doing this, Howard, I took some surveys at first because I knew I was going to be criticized and, if you want, ostracized. And I started evaluating the uh, referral patterns that general dentists had before they took my course. And to make a long story short, what I found after the first five or six, seven years of doing this, that the general dentists that I had the opportunity to train were doing a lot of orthodontists, and they were doing it to the standard of care that an orthodontist does it. But they were referring 400% of the, of the number of patients that they were referring before they took the course. Now, some orthodontists bought that and really actually started getting calls from orthodontists saying, thanks, you're doing a great job. My referrals are much more educated now. I'm actually seeing more referrals. But by and large, the major part of the orthodontic community still feels what you just described, that we shouldn't be teaching the general dentist orthodontics. Um, I can give you some reasons, and some of them are valid uh, unless they get the proper kind of education. The re you, you mentioned that eight out of the nine specialties have no qualms with teaching general dentist orthodontics. Let me tell you two reasons, not two reasons, two aspects of that, that same question. Why isn't orthodontics taught at the undergraduate level in the dental school? And then extending that, why shouldn't we? Why don't we teach, or why aren't orthodontists comfortable teaching general dentist orthodontics outside the university? Orthodontics is different. Okay, that doesn't mean it's better, it's worse, it's different. Main difference is a unit of crown and bridge or a unit of endo treatment can be done in a matter of measured in a matter of hours, maybe days if you have to wait for the lab work. Therefore, you can do it on a repeatable basis over and over and over again while you're in dental school. And you can teach a general dentist effectively how to do endodontics or chronic bridge by doing 100 restorations. One unit of orthodontics takes two to three years to complete, and then another two to three years to see if it worked and to what extent it worked and to what extent it's going to change. So the nature of the treatment is much more longitudinal, therefore, from a management standpoint, much harder to do in, in dental school. So I understand that. That doesn't mean it can't be done or it shouldn't have been done, but that was possibly a legitimate part of the argument about you really general generalists are looking for a quick again i can show you how to do an upper uh, an upper root canal in a matter of an hour and you can do 50 of them and you're pretty good at it you can't do that with orthodontics the other aspect of it that orthodontists try to to use as why they shouldn't be teaching general dentists is that it's based on totally different principles than what we learned learned in dental school in dental school we don't understand we don't study any of us don't study bone muscle interaction we don't study uh, craniofacial growth and development. We don't study um, genetics. We don't study form function relationships. So the fundamental basis of orthodontics is very different from the things that dentists learn in dental school. And uh, I think back to when I first started uh, looking at this and I had this, I ran two departments. And it's, let's go back to the University of Detroit. In 1971, I, in 1970, I became the chairman there, and I spent the next 11 years trying to integrate an orthodontic program into the general dental curriculum. I had 10 hours in the curriculum of, in, during four years. Our crown and bridge department at the University of Detroit had 900 hours. The emphasis was obviously, obviously on crown and bridge because those were the powers that ran the dental school, but just as importantly, when a young man or woman gets out of dental school, there's really nothing on the state boards that has required any information about orthodontics. So the students were looking at what they had to complete and what they had to learn to get out of dental school and then secondarily to pass their boards. And the fa faculty was primarily interested in teaching graduate students, so it, the, the gap just went unfilled. The problem for me is that it not only led to 
you know, as you just used the term blackballed or ostracizing people who tried to teach General Dennis, it led to a bunch of short courses, misinformation, and inappropriate education that was finally did become available for the, for the general practitioner outside of school. People from within the community, like myself, were not willing to do it. So what they got was others filling the void. And I've spent probably 20 years of my career trying to undo some of the misinformation that is spread out, that is given to general dentists by unqualified educators, if you will. You want to call any out or any camps out or any? No, no, I don't want to call any camps out. I will tell you. It is dentistry are... uncensored and no one will argue with two old bald no, guys. No, that's okay. It's not a personal thing. No, the no, I know it's is... not personal, but, I, but, uh, but I, 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 I have always told these dentists who are going to these uh, short-term ortho courses, whether it be six months, small, six months, brace, whatever. I always say, you know, first get your foundation. Go see Richard and learn classic orthodontics that your orthodontist does. Why don't you, that's the base of the pyramid. Then you can go up and learn some uh, aligners and, and, and things like, you know, short term. Do you agree with that assessment or not? Not only do I agree with that, I'd pay you to keep saying it. I couldn't say it any better. It's exactly what well, I why, say. Why don't, you, why don't you write an editorial about that for Dental Town Magazine? Why, why don't you write a, a, an opinion piece on that? That, you know, if you want to do short-term ortho, six-month smiles, six-month braces, power products, 10 minute aligners, I mean, there's, multiple camps first build out the base of the pyramid with a classical you know ortho well that's that, that's absolutely the, <clears throat> what i leave uh, how to well, get it's that true. Idea. well it's how, true it's it's just absolutely true i mean it's not something you believe it, it's math it's physical no i agree that i agree with that and it's it's not you can name all of those things fast braces high speed braces six month smiles all of those things all of those are aimed at, at showing the dentist how and how to do it and how to do it quickly and how to make money but nobody talks about the when the why and the underlying principles about it the diagnosis uh, that, and treatment plan yeah, that takes time and that takes effort and that takes energy six month smiles for example or high speed braces or fast braces all that is is the first three to four to five to six months of orthodontics Okay, after that, if you don't care about finishing the case or establishing occlusion or making sure the CO and CR are in harmony and all the other fundamental things, things that we need to think about, uh, you could do six months braces. Somebody who finishes my program, they can do six months smiles. Just stop after you slide, line up the six upper and lower through your teeth. That's what I call half ass orthodontics rather than high speed braces. But if you want to do that, you can. You talked about Invisalign. Uh, most of those, pl those programs, programs are selling appliances or a technique, they're not selling an orthodontic education. When you talk, uh, Invisalign is a classic example of, of uh, outstanding marketing, selling a, a relatively straight, straightforward, simple appliance. It's a product. It's like people say, I'm an Invisalign orthodontist. And I ask them, have you ever gone out telling anybody, buddy, you're a 557 Crosscut Fisher Bird dentist? Because <laughs> that's what it is. It's, all Invisalign is, is a tool, is a tool that some people use. It has significant limitations. It has a certain place, especially in our uh, adult patient population who are aesthetic conscious. But even to use Invisalign, uh, years ago I was asked by the people who, who were started Invisalign before it went into all this other large corporation stuff, uh, would, I, would I be interested in teaching some courses? And when I said yes, my, preface was, my premise was the appliance is great, but you, before you start using Invisalign or any other quick, uh, what do you want, a quick uh, treatment protocol, you need to understand, as you just said, diagnosis, treatment planning, bone muscle interaction, long-term stability, instability issues in orthodontics. You need to understand all of orthodontic diagnostic modalities in order to make appropriate diagnosis and then decide which tool that you want to use to solve the problem. The problem in then is if all you have is that one tool, tool everything looks like a perfect case for that tool. You know that old saying, if, every, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But if all you have is Invisalign, everything looks like a non-extraction simple alignment kit. And unfortunately, that's not true. So it's it is a very effective tool on a very, 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 very limited number of number patients. And I don't have any problem with the tool. I have a problem with the people using it who haven't had any education to understand what they're doing. Man, that's been a, that Invisalign, that's been a hell of a stock, hasn't it? I mean, a five-year, uh, you know, 20 to 60, what a, what a stock that thing's been. Um, From a business standpoint, it was a genius, a genius marketing plan. Yeah, and now um, is, is it true that the patents are kind of coming to an end, and there'll be more competition with uh, what well, is this? Yeah, that has happened. From I don't follow that very closely, but from what I understand, that happened a number of years, years ago. Because you have 
other corporations that have all added a series of alerts now, where there's clear correct and there's uh, half a dozen others. Actually, it, you, you raise a really good point, and we can talk about it right now. I was doing a presentation at the San Diego Dental Society meeting not that long ago, and someone asked me about Invisalign. And I just happened to have seen the day before an advertisement that showed you can now order your trays. You can bypass. You, the patient, can bypass the dentist now and order trays and a, a, a paperwork that you can de design your own treatment and send it to a company that will send you back the trays. Do you remember the company called Sharper Image? Yes. And the catalog. Well, they are now have. They used to have an ad where you could you could buy this box, and you could inside that box was a kind of impression material. You could stand up, put your foot in that box, take an impression of your foot, and send it to the lab, and they'd make you an orthotic. And we don't need the podiatrist anymore. Well, they're doing that now with clear aligners. So who's doing not it? Only is patent, not only is the patent gone, and companies like Clear Correct and some of the other big corporations are selling clear aligners. Every orthotic supply company has a division selling clear aligners now, but you don't even need the dentist anymore. You can go right to the patient. You can buy impression material and send it to the lab. Do you know the name of that company? Smile something, but I don't know it off the top of my head, but I can get it to you at a later point. Okay, yeah, send it to me. That, uh, are you gonna, uh, uh, that, that, that's amazing. Hey, speaking of, um, you, you said ortho takes two or three years, not to get off topic, but you know, we, we see advertisements for things that accelerate ortho. Uh, yeah. Propel, things like that. Are you, has any, sure. any of that got your attention? Oh, yeah. It's got my attention, and I would be very excited to see it happen. The only one of all those things that is showing any um, any evidence that it actually has some degree of speeding up or not tooth movement is the traumatic, you know, controlled trauma. It started with the Wilkes brothers doing their, their surgical procedures, perio and ortho combination, where they lay a flap and do corticotomies in between all the teeth, and then you, then you buy the teeth. The traumatic injury increases cell turnover rate and therefore it would speed up tooth movement. It's a rather aggressive and a major surgical intervention and extremely expensive. So then somebody got the good idea of let's, maybe we can do um, interproximal microtraumas, similar to Propel and some of these other ideas. And so they're trying to do that by changing cell turnover rates and speeding up tooth movement. Wonderful, biologically sound concept. Not a shred of scientific evidence available yet anywhere in any publication that it has any clinical significant effect on speeding up treatment. Is there hope? Yes. There's hope in terms of uh, injectables. There's hope in terms of uh, controlling things like injecting prostaglandins into the periodontal ligament. So it is actually, you have to really good question. Um, that is really probably the forefront of orthodontic research at most of the universities today. You know, a number of years ago is what the functional appliances work. And then it went on to, you know, uh, mechanical things and technical things. But now it seems to be that the, the research that I'm seeing is in the area you just asked about. What are the possible ways in which we can speed up treatment? And, you know, Howard, all of that has been triggered by one thing. Money is the answer. What's the question? Yeah, no, that, that, wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't what I was thinking. But, yeah, bottom line, that too. What has been triggered by is the same, the same thing that triggered Invisalign, the same thing that in, that triggered clear appliances, the same thing that tri triggered all these aesthetic appliances and the, the white r wires and all that, adults seeking orthodontic treatment. When I was, and the only reason adults are seeking orthodontic treatment is because we have made orthodontics so efficient now that the orthodontist can handle, the, the trained orthodontist can handle 500, 600, 700, 1,000 cases a year in his or her office. Where when my predecessors started, started two generations ago, if they were lucky, they started 50 to 90 cases a year and they did everything by hand. So we can deliver orthodontics much more efficiently. Uh, we've had zero population growth over the last couple of generations. We have far more people practicing orthodontics. So all of a sudden, orthodontics became available to the adults. You know, we needed more patients. That's why adults are now seeking orthodontics. And once that happened, we started looking at how do we satisfy the adults. And one of those things is speeding up treatment because they would come into the office and say, Okay, can I do this without braces? Okay, can we do this in six months instead of two years? That's the trigger. Money, yes, of course, money is at the, the underlying basis for all that. But still, it's the adults entering orthodontics that has changed the nature of all those things today. When I, was in, when I got out of graduate school, if I saw two adults in a year, it was a lot. Today, 30 to 40% of the patients in orthodontic practice are non-growing adults over the age of 18. And then many of them are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So it's a different world today. And the speeding up the treatment is a very hot commodity. And I think there will be 
some enhancements and improvements in it, but until we see the evidence, I think it's just another marketing ploy. Now, now, now that it's gone from you know two adults a year to thirty to forty percent of an orthodontist practice, is that kind of changing the open bay concept? I mean, does a does a fifty year old man want to be sitting in an open bay with uh, two twelve year olds on each side of him? No, that's absolutely true. Yeah, the design of offices is changing, and most orthodontic offices they used to have a quiet room, you know, where you had a management issue like the pediatric dentist. Now they have adult rooms. So many of them still have an open day, but there's at least a couple of operatories, maybe more in every practice, uh, because adults don't want to be sitting with six other kids around them in a circle and somebody's try, uh, crying or somebody's vomiting with an impression tray in their mouth. So, no, it's very different from a physical development standpoint in terms of office design. That, that was the first market read read, read that I learned to, to get into an ortho is when adults were coming to me and saying, I want to get ortho, but I don't want to go in there with, you know, Sit down my briefcase and be next to you know five kids over the bay. That that kid that they, they used to say that orthodontist only does kids, and that's where I saw the first opening for general dentists to get involved. But but I want to start back to the very very beginning. The the okay. the thing that always was my beef about ortho education is that you know these dentists you know they're always the first to tell you they graduated three hundred thousand dollars student loans loans, but they they never know their math of the fact that the the taxpayer picked up half the tab of that dental school. So when you graduate from law school, med school, or dental school, the lady working at the Waffle House, her taxes paid for half of your education. In some cases, it might be you know 75, 80 percent of your education. And then then they send these kids back to 19,022 towns in America, half of which don't have any specialists. They don't have an endodontist, orthodontist, and they, they send these kids back and train. And then that kid is coming into the dentist every six months with some facial problem that could have been fixed, intercepted. And the dentist is asleep behind the wheel because they don't understand what's going on. And then by the time everybody figures out this girl's going to smile with her upper gum showing or doesn't have a chin or, or something like that, then they need orthodontic surgery. And I, I, I always thought that was the, the true crime that the rural kids don't get, they don't get intercepted treatment. And that's, that's why I always thought that every single general dentist has to be completely classically trained and orthodontics just for diagnosing and treatment planning because if you just sit there and say oh you know your daughter's sick she should be an orthodontist that's not how you sell you can only sell with passion and and it's when you're looking at mom and dad saying you know the orthodontist can fix this right now in 12 months but if she finishes growing the only way they're going to fix this is with an oral surgeon and you you have to go in there now and that passion that feeling to really get mom and dad to go to the orthodontist, the, the general dentist has to be highly educated on the diagnosing and treatment planning. Couldn't agree more. And you remember what I just said a minute ago is that what I saw after five or six years of teaching general dentists is they were all doing orthodontics, but they were sending four times as many patients to the orthodontist simply because they recognize it. I actually did start getting, as I said, some positive feedback from orthodontists saying, you know, there are some positive benefits. Yeah, at first we thought you were taking money out of our mouths. But we are seeing more patients, and they're better educated patients. So uh, there's no doubt about that, Howard. And you and I are singing the same song. I, I and, it, and it was the believe. same. And it was the same thing when um when I got out of school. God, this is going back to different mindset. When I got out of school, the University of Missouri Kansas City, everybody in that building, um, the two guys that were placing implants behind their back, they were all called butchers, crazy men, stick and titanium bars, Ramus. I mean, they were they were presented as nutballs. So when I got out, I never diagnosed no, and treatment plan an implant for a sinus lifter. I mean, I totally bought into that. You'd have to be a nut to be doing implants. And it wasn't until I flew all the way to the University of Pittsburgh and went to the uh, Mish Institute and was telling Mish what I was thinking. And, and some of those early implantologists literally had their license. Away. The first case that failed, the state board would take their license away. And now, you know, there's 275 companies selling implants, and people don't realize that 2016, go back to 1980, and you were a quack doing that stuff. I mean, yeah. God, it's amazing how everything's changed. It sure has. That's a, that's a good example too. Yeah, it's it's, coming, it's basically the same issue. If you don't if you don't have the skill to diagnose the problem, you don't see the problem, then nobody's going to get that treatment. Well, and that's the biggest problem in not educating general dentists in dental school. Because why do you think, you just said the number of, of implants uh, companies that have, have cropped up, but why do you think that that general dentists, uh, all these courses have cropped up, six-month smiles, high-speed braces, Invisalign, clear, correct? Why have they cropped up? Because there was a void that marketers and businessmen saw they could sell 
to the general dentist. Had general dentists been educated the way they should have been in dental school, those courses, those things wouldn't exist. People would see the dentist would see the flaws in them and be looking for a better education. No question about it. So, so, cut to um, how do my homies? Um, how do they learn orthodontics from you? Orthodontics right now. Where where are you? T- what what's your website? Uh, the website is forceint.com. Force I N T. Force International. So F O R C E I N T, and force, force stands for Faculty for Orthodontic Research and Continuing Education. Forceint.com. And yeah. how is it um, all lecture, or can you do it online? No, that's a good question too. I uh, I'm still doing a number of seminars, in-person seminars. I am because of what you said in the first few minutes we were talking here the advent of online education and, for example, what we're using right now, Skype and Join Me and some of the other available technologies that are online. I am moving in that direction, but I still offer my comprehensive orthodontic course in a number of cities across the U.S. and Canada. And I'm going to come back to the Canada thing in a minute because relative to the other question you were talking about, kids in small towns not getting access to orthodontics. Why would you do ortho in Canada? They're just going to get their teeth knocked out with a hockey puck. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but if they have, if they're wearing their retainers, at least they all stay in the same place when they get hit with the fuck. No, Canada became for the same. I'll, we'll come back to your question in a minute about my educational, the educational courses available and the, how we deliver it. But well, let me talk about Canada for a minute. Because Canada became a very successful educational environment for me because there were a limited number of orthodontists and there were thousands of kids in small towns, some of them way up north, far away from, a, from an orthodontist. And their parents would have to take them four or five hours in a car to get to an orthodontist. So the, the, the generalist and the pediatric dentist in Canada had to learn how to do orthodontics. There was nobody available to do it. So my product was very appealing to them. And therefore, I was uh, it was um, well accepted all across Canada. And I gave courses from Halifax to Victoria for years. And I still do. I'm going next week. I'm on my way up to Vancouver to do another uh, comprehensive course. And I still do courses in Vancouver, in uh, Toronto. Uh, we did them in Ottawa, we, all across Canada. Now I've kind of done it in two major centers, Toronto and Vancouver, and the Canadians will travel to those places. Um, the issue, in, in to go back to what you were asking me where we can, where someone can learn orthodontics. Our courses are offered live in a number of cities. Right now, Vancouver, Toronto, Detroit. We're starting a course in San Diego, California. I'm also doing one in next December and January in San Juan, Puerto Rico. The primary areas are Detroit, Toronto, Vancouver, and San Diego. But we also, about 10 years ago, we put our entire program online. So someone could take the FORCE program by going to our website and taking FORCE, the comprehensive course, online. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, when I do it live, it is essentially seven and a half to eight days of lecture, three and a half days in each of two segments, uh, one one month, one the following month. When we do it online, there's 20 hours of lecture, me standing in front of a video camera and doing the exact same program. Um, And then we have a lot of supplemental issues. We have a lot of clinical videos. We have hands-on technique videos. We have basically all the tools that you need to learn orthodontics can be done online by looking at the FORCE online program. And and so if I were to learn ortho from A to Z online, it's 20 hours long at forceint.com? Yeah. 20 hours? Force, yes, but that's only the lecture series. Now there are clinical videos, there are technique videos, and I've always said, not just the Force Online or the Force Lecture Series, the comprehensive course, that's just the beginning. I'm not foolish enough to believe that I can take any general dentist, no matter how smart they are, and teach them how to do effective clinical orthodontics in eight days. It's not possible. I can teach you how to get started, I can teach you how to think like an orthodontist, but we have ongoing study groups that meet in multiple cities across the U.S. and Canada on a regular basis. So I, for example, I go to Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Ottawa, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Detroit, several cities in the Midwest, and we meet three to four times a year with the participants who've graduated from the course. And they bring their, their records and their cases and their, I mean, you know, it's a study group. You learn from each other. I'm, the, I'm just the man who facilitates it. Can I, and, can and I be your... Can I be your luggage bellman in San Juan, Puerto Rico? Absolutely. Rico? I'll share my frequent flyer miles with you. I'm not, oh, you know, my I'm God. That is the coolest place on earth. But, Howard, that is the reason we started the online program, because the traveling is difficult. I've had people take my course from Dubai. I've had people in Japan take the course. So how, how, much is your, how much is your online course? Well, let me back up. The, the, 
the course in, in person is eighty nine ninety five, eight thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars for both sessions. And and, and um, how, how and two sessions? How, how many days each, each? How many days? It's three and a half days each session. Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, half a day. Then the online course. If you take the course online, there are certain things that you're not getting. First of all, you don't have the opportunity to talk and ask me questions because it's just video clips and you watch the whole thing from start to finish. You, it's interactive. You can play at any point and go back and use it any way you want, but you don't have the opportunity to ask questions. So the tuition for the online course is forty nine ninety five. If then, and we've had a number of people do this, if after you've taken the online course and now you have a basis and a fundamental starting point, now you can come back and take the live course and that forty nine ninety five is a supply to the $89.95 oh, that is so cool. tuition. So for the $4,000 balance, you can retake the entire course live. The, the live course also has a hands-on clinical program that obviously you can't do online. So the last day and a half is working on, on a type of dont and bonding. So, and, dude, you know what your best marketing in the world would be? You. Um, your best marketing in the world would be of that 20 hours online, take the first hour or two or whatever and make an online – put it up on Dentaltown – and um, put it on Dental Town for free, and then they get to see you. I mean, there's 210,000 dentists on Dental Town, and 40,000 downloaded the app on the phone, which you can take the online CE on the Android phone and the iPhone. So then they get to see you for an hour, and anybody that sees you for an hour is going to fall in love with you and know that you master the concept. You have really high likability factor. And then at the very end of the video and say, you just completed one hour, two hours, and you want the remaining 18 hours, log on to Force International and give me your credit card and finish it. Well, we did. We started that with you. You know, you have one of our courses online. You have the Sweeping Away the Myths, Facts versus Fiction course. But what year was that, though? That was a couple, three years ago. Yeah. That was intended to do that, to just what you said, to give people the opportunity. You know, before, I don't care who you are, whether you're John, uh, John Coyce or Frank Spears or anybody, before, before you're going to dump that kind of money into taking a course, you want to see who that person is and how do they project themselves and do they legitimately have the information and the, the ability to teach me. So um, we offered that course, and my hope was that the trigger interest in people contacting us and taking the online course or the, taking the live course. My uh, doing this podcast with you has the same intentions. Uh, I'm sure it has for you as well as it has for me, hoping that will um, give people the opportunity to hear what we do, see what we're doing, and then follow through by either taking it live or online. So there are probably some other things that we can talk about, uh, about what I might be able to do in conjunction with you in terms of the, the uh, ortho town or the, uh, your, your, your video programs available. But uh, I'm certainly amenable to online marketing and to video marketing. The whole idea, I'm still going strong. My whole idea is to still get as many people into the room as I can because it's in my personal best interest, obviously, as a businessman, but it's also in the best interest of dentistry and the best interest of patients seeking orthodontics. And I don't know anybody – a lot of my very close friends uh, took your course, and they all just loved it. I mean they loved yeah. you and the I course. Still, thank you. I still remember Mike Totola and some of the other people that you – Bob Savage, to. Tim Taylor, yeah. Tom Matter, all of them. That, sure. That was just amazing. Amazing. Me. So so what are the big what, – what are the – this is dentistry and censored. What are the controversies in orthodontics? What um, – you know, is it w – w back in the day um, – one of the reasons that I started doing ortho back in 87 and learning from you is the fact that if I sent 100 cases to the orthodontist, 100 out of 100 had four bicuspid extraction. And it seemed like they were doing the ortho in like eight to 12 months and spending a year trying to close that space over the boat. But, but that's really faded away a lot. What, what, what are the big controversies today? Yeah, well, that's probably still the single biggest controversy, even though all the data is in. The issue of extraction versus non-extraction is still one of the major controversies in orthodontics. And there are people today, uh, not too many orthodontists, but a lot of other general dentist gurus that are selling the idea, and even some orthodontists selling the idea that we don't take out teeth anymore. And that's actually ludicrous, but there are still some really supposedly intelligent people making those statements. And there's, it's still a battle. There are people um, who I have great respect for. Unfortunately, Vince Kokich was one who passed away recently, who, who was constantly uh, trying to defend, like I do, the issue of orthodontic needs by cuspid extractions in a certain percentage of our cases. Let me take your statement and say 100% out, 100 out of 100, probably a little bit of an exaggeration. I know you're not often prone to exaggeration, but that was probably a little, <laughs> bit of an exaggeration, a little bit of an exaggeration. But 
I have a slide in my presentation that shows the history of extractions in orthodontics. And if you go back to 1909, when orthodontics became the first specialty, Edward Hartley Engel was the father of orthodontics, and he never believed that extractions were necessary, out of ignorance. We didn't have any idea. We had no research. We had no history of, of success, no in history of instability or stability after treatment. So for the first 20 years in orthodontics, there were zero extractions done. And what happened then was some of his students who became world-renowned figures, Charles Tweed and right near you in Tucson, Arizona, and, and Calvin Case and others who were students of Engel, treated patients non-extraction for, for years. And it took them about 10 years before they realized all this expansion stuff collapsed when you let go of it sooner or later. So the pendulum swung the other way. In the 1940s, 70% of patients that went into an orthodontic office received bicuspid extractions. The reason? 1940, of, it was 40%? No, it was 0% until about 1930. And then by the 1940, it was up to 70%. And that was because Calvin Case and Charles Tweed had shown that while they listened to Angle to, to get their education, they tried what he told them to treat everybody non-extraction, that a significant percentage of their cases were collapsing back to where they were before. Every case that they tried to expand the arches on, especially the lower arch, would rebound back, so the crowding would come back completely. They turned around then and decided to extract four by cuspids. They over, overdid it. They overreacted. And so the incidence of extraction stayed high in the 40s and into the early 50s. And then we gradually began to see that we were over-retracting teeth. We were getting too flat a facial profile, we as a specialty. And we were extracting cases that probably what we call borderline today, but were being treated with extractions. So the incidence gradually went down. Went down to maybe, instead of 70%, went down to 40%. When I got out of graduate school, it was about 40%. And that was 1969. And then something else changed dramatically. Early treatment became a fad. And as we did early treatment, and I'm not talking about 6.30 in the morning, I'm talking about 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old <laughs> kids. When we, when we started doing early treatment, we realized something that has changed the face of extraction, non-extraction issues. And that is, we saved the leeway space. The two most important appliances I own are a lingual arch and a transpalatal bar. Because if I can save the leeway space, I can significantly reduce the incidence of extractions. Tony Gianelli at Boston University a number of years ago in the 70s did a beautiful study, a simple one. He looked at 100 consecutive kids that came into the clinic there in the orthodontic department, and 77% of them had less than had four millimeters or less of crowding. Another 7% of them, now we're up to 84%, had six millimeters of crowding or less. So only 15% or 16% of the kids had enough crowding to require extractions. Why are we extracting teeth in 40% of the cases? Because we weren't saving the leeway space? And in addition to that, there are other reasons that require extractions. For, for example, biomaxillary protrusive patients who have a soft tissue protrusive problem, and it can't be resolved without taking out teeth. But the incidence of extractions went down in orthodontic practices, again, now after the 1980s into the 1990s, to about 20 25%. Maybe in some practices where you see only adults or older patients, you don't have the opportunity to save the leeway space, maybe it would be down to 20 25%. In young Pediatric-oriented practice might be down to 15%. And then there are other Ex techniques. Expl explain the leeway space. Some kid might not um, get that. Okay. The leeway space is a difference between the size of the erupting cuspid and first and second bicuspids compared to the mesiodistal diameters of primary canine, primary first molar, primary second molar. So in the lower arch, the different, you know, adults and parents don't understand this either when you tell them I'm putting in this base maintainer because the permanent teeth are smaller than the baby teeth. You know, they look at you kind of funny. But if you look at the widths of the three, the four, and the five, that's the lower cuspid, first bite, second bite, compared to the C, the D, and the E, that's the primary canine, first molar, second molar, there's two and a half millimeters of difference on each side. So if you save the leeway space in the lower arch by putting in a lingual arch, I have five extra millimeters of space to unravel the five millimeters of crowding in the anterior. And there's two millimeters in the upper arch. So by saving the leeway space, we, have, we can significantly decrease the incidence of extractions, but it ain't going to zero because there are people who are protrusive, there are people who are hyperdivergent or have long faces and they tend to crowd up over time. There are aesthetic issues where people who are only slightly protrusive don't like it, and therefore they prefer to have their teeth moved back, back. There's all kinds of variables. So if you look at the data today, our journal suggests that if you interviewed every orthodontist in the U.S. and Canada, you'd find that somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of the patients in offices require extractions. Maybe in a guy who believes in a lot of interproximal stripping, who does a lot of early treatment, who does palatal expansion, and some other procedures that we can use to decrease the incidence of extraction, maybe you might see this low as 
But when I hear people stand up in front of an audience and say, I haven't seen an extraction case in 10,000 cases in the last 15 years of my practice, I believe that 20% of those patients they're treating are being treated with malpractice. But extre- said, but that's just that's just part of the human condition. I mean, if you're an extremism and any, I mean, if, 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 like like it blows my mind when dentists say like I'm metal free in my practice. It's like right. you, really you've never seen one incidence for an, that an amalgam would be better. You don't even have it in your office. They go, oh, I'm metal free. Do you, do you fly metal free airplanes? Do you drive metal free cars? I mean, really. Yeah. So so yeah. So when, when someone says that they don't do any extractions. I mean, that's just a red flag that they, they, they can't think. They're a binomial thinker. Everything's black, white, left, right, up, down. You're just not smart if you're an extremist. Absolutely true. But you'd be surprised at how many people there's. Certainly, it's being taught to the general dentist. And let me tell you why. If you go into, let's look at the economics of it. When I do an extraction case, and I'm going to give you figures relative to the metropolitan Detroit or the Midstern region. The average extraction case, four by custom extraction case, takes about 20 to 22 months of, chair time, of treatment time. It takes probably somewhere between two and a half and three and a half hours of chair time. Not all of that is the orthodontist doing it, that's the staff too. And the average fee in metropolitan Detroit area is somewhere between, let's say, $5,500 and $6,500 for a four by custom extraction case. Now, a non extraction case takes about 30% of the chair time. Because, as you just pointed out a minute ago, the significant amount of time is taken by trying to translate teeth through bone to close an extraction site. So the average treatment time for an extraction for a non-extraction case is probably 40% less than, a, than a, an extraction case. The mechanics are simpler. The side effects are fewer. It is infinitely easier to treat a patient non-extraction than it is extraction. And so it's infinitely easier to treat a patient with cancer with aspirin than it is with chemotherapy, too. But just unfortunately, it doesn't work. So what we've been doing is, and we still do, we charge the patients who get non-extraction treatment a higher fee than they should be charged relative to the fact that the patient next to them is having four bicuspids extracted and paying a, a, almost the same fee. The fees are very, very, the range in fees is 10%. The range in effort and time and risk is about 40%. So therefore, wouldn't you be smart from a business standpoint to treat everybody non-extraction? You make a lot more money. Let's keep going with the non-extraction because the one thing I've also noticed in the 30 years of being a dentist is that the um, some countries like Germany have realized that you know you know Amer- Americans pull your four wisdom teeth because they exist and a lot of people believe I'm pulling these four wisdom teeth because you see on the pano these impacted wisdom teeth then you see the lower anterior is crowding so you just say these two wisdom teeth are pushing all these teeth and the incisors are collapsing and that's a huge uh, more more dentists in Germany are more likely to say no. Erupting wisdom teeth do not cause mandibular anterior crowding than in America. American dentists. Yeah, that's probably I, true, but not, the ones who have listened to me will know that there's no relationship. The ones who are. We'll talk about uh, that because I I, I I firmly believe half the dentists in the United States believe that those uh, impacted wisdom teeth are causing. I, I did too, because when I got out of dental school, the old surgery department told me that when the wisdom teeth come in, they cause lower incisor crowding. But then we have a number of studies. Don Woodside at Toronto, a number of years ago, did a beautiful study at the Burlington Growth Center outside of Toronto, where they had a number of children. I think there were 25 in each of three samples. And in one sample, they had a group of children that had no wisdom teeth, congenitally missing. Another sample, matched sample, same number of boys, same number of girls, same average age, et cetera. So the only variable was the presence or absence of the wisdom teeth. So in one sample, they had no wisdom teeth. In another sample, they had erupted wisdom teeth in position. And in the third sample, they had mesoangular impacted upper and lower with the wisdom teeth. There was no difference in the incidence of crowding whatsoever. None. It's got nothing to do with wisdom teeth. The reason that their surgery blamed it because it's kind of circumstantial evidence. We get lower incisor crowding, even people who had none when they were 12, 13, 14, 15, no crowding. We'll start to get some lower incisor crowding between the ages of 18 and 30. When do your wisdom teeth come in? 20, 21, sometimes 18. So your wisdom teeth are coming in coincidentally about the same time we begin to see lower incisor crowding. Therefore, it got the blame partly out of ignorance and partly out of serves my purpose because now I can get people to send me all these cases, the surgeons now can get people to send me cases for extraction. The reality of it is the same number of, the same percentage of people will have the same amount of crowding if they, if they have no wisdom teeth, if they have impacted wisdom teeth, if they have, they have fully erupted wisdom teeth. The reason we get crowding is the late increments of mandibular growth driving the contained mandibular dentition into the maxillary arch where the sutures in the mid-face fuse at 14 or 15, but condylar growth continues for many, many years after that. So you're driving these lower teeth into this wedge. That's why we get lower incisor crowding. 
and everybody's going to get it to some extent, 90% of the population uh, is going to get it to some extent, irrespective of wisdom teeth. Now, why that's in Germany, I don't know, but it, an interesting thought. I had a wonderful experience in graduate school. I went to Northwestern University. One of my teachers was a man by the name of Harry Sisher. I don't know if you've heard that name before, but it was the world's renowned bone biologist. He wrote a book with a man named Weinmann, both German, right? Well, Sisher was Austrian, but it came out of that area in the world. And they wrote a book called Bone and Bones, and he was just, he was a genius. He was probably recognized as one of the early pioneers and the greatest contributors in the history of understanding bone physiology, bone, facial growth, etc. We had a class with him, which was one of the highlights of my career. And he talked about wisdom teeth, and he said, wisdom teeth, even if they did theoretically push against the posterior of the lower second molars, can you picture what's at the apical end of an erupting wisdom tooth? Cell proliferation, right? Against medullary bone. Can you picture something that's d differentially adding cells, pushing 12 teeth forward to crowding up lower, 12 teeth made up of enamel contacting each other, being driven together by an erupting molar pushing against soft bone? He likened it to the fact that you're standing by the side of the road and you're trying, and your feet are in mud and you try to lift your car to put on a spare tire. Is the car going anywhere or your feet going into the mud? That was his analogy. And I never forgot that, but that wasn't data. That was his explanation, his analogy to explain it. The data shows no relationship whatsoever. Now, why it happens, as you said, in Germany, I don't know. My guess is that's probably a misunderstanding in a lot of countries around the world. Well, while we're talking around the world, I want you – I can't think of a greater orthodontic historian than you. Um, talk about um, – a, a lot of the older dentists, they used to hear back in the day that Americans would do four bicuspid extraction – and the Europeans would do four second molar extractions. And then there was another character out of uh, Europe, uh, Witzig, who was a lot of that non-extraction. Remember, remember Witzig? Yeah, he wasn't out of Europe. Witzig was but, but, out of Milwaukee, his Wisconsin, his, but he went to Europe. His technique went, was out of Europe. Yeah, he went to Europe, and he spent two days in the office of an orthodontist named Gerhard Schmuth in Bonn, West Germany, and he came back an expert on orthodontics. <laughs> <laughs> and what he did was actually, uh, unfortunately, for he, he passed away. So I don't want to have anything negative to say about the man as an individual. But what he did with his misrepresentation of information is created an idea of everything should be treated non-extraction. And again, we, we, the specialty, are just as responsible for what happened after that because we had not educated the general dentists who were listening to Witzig to understand that what he was saying was unadulterated BS. It made no sense whatsoever. So if you have an uneducated audience and you're a good speaker, and you're selling what they want to hear, he's preaching to the choir, he, he convinced them that orthodontists don't know what they're doing. And can you believe that? I don't take that personally, but can you believe a dentist can sit in a room and listen to this man say that 9,000 orthodontists in the United States are stupid, and I have the answer? And he had two days of training in an office in Bonn, West Germany. So, But they did, because they wanted to hear that. And what he said was, orthodontic treatment causes temporomandibular mandibular joint dysfunction, orthodontic treatment with the bicuspid extractions, dishes in the face. It took us 10 years or more with significant study, lots of evidence to disprove all that information. But there are remnants of it that still, still are around. And unfortunately, we are still fighting the battle of bicuspid extraction. I don't want to do bicuspid extraction for the reason I told you a minute ago. I make more money on a non-extraction case. But I can't treat a patient who needs four bicuspid extraction. It's non-extraction. It's not as malpractice. It's not in their best interest. And, and, so, and you're saying about what percent of, a, of an orthodontist practice in America needs to be four bicuspid extraction? What would again, be a good? I said, said a minute ago, it could range anywhere, in my opinion, and based on the data we see in the surveys done by the Journal of Clinical Orthodontics, anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. Okay, but, have, go ahead. But but then go around the world because the one bizarre thing about the um, United States and Canada. Um, you know, we're a melting pot. Just, I mean, you go to Vietnam, they're pretty much all Vietnamese. You go to Korea, they're all Korean. You go to Poland, they're 98% Poland. Um, will, you, will you talk about the variants around the world? I mean, what, what, would, that, what would that be? Uh, how is orthodontic different in a homogenous population like Japan or Korea versus or Poland versus the United Kingdom where everybody's from somewhere around the world? Because Americans are mostly all mutts, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, yeah, even, but, even if an American tells you they're Italian – with just three follow-up questions, you find out their dad's German and their mom's. Yeah, yeah. You know. and their four generations ago they were Italian. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. I don't They're, think your ethnicity or the uh, your your the group that you evolved from, whether it be Italian or Russian or Ukrainian or Korean, whatever, has a significant 
impact on the incidence of extraction. There are differences. For example, what we consider a bimaxillary protrusion and require extractions in a Caucasian population is perfectly normal for an African-American population or Hispanic population. So you won't take out as many teeth to reduce protrusion in a sample of people who are naturally protrusive by Caucasian standards. And that same thing happens, for example, in Korea, Japan, and any of the Asian countries, you have a much higher instance of skeletal class three prognathic mandibles. Therefore, a lot of compensatory extractions have to be done because of their acidity and the nature of their growth pattern and their skeletal relationships, some more extractions have to be done to solve the underlying problem and avoid surgery. So there are subtle reasons why you might find a higher or lower incidence of extractions in different ethnic groups. The biggest, answer, the biggest difference in the answer to your question, I believe, is you can go to countries in Europe, not so much today, but 15, 20 years ago. Today it's different because almost all those countries have sent people to the United States and Canada, Canada to get educated. So they all go back. I have classmates from Switzerland and from England, and they went back there, and they brought North American principles to the European countries. But, for example, I spent many years <coughs> excuse me, teaching in France. When I started going over there, nobody took out teeth. I went over there and talked about headgears and bicuspid extractions. They looked at me like I had horns. Hmm. What are you talking about? And the reason is, the, it goes back to one word you used a few times, money. There was no money for fixed appliance therapy in Europe. Those were socialized healthcare systems. Orthodontics was paid for by the government completely. And you know what they paid? $50, $100. I was in England several times and I was stunned by what I saw and what I heard. Uh, yes, our country covers orthodontic treatment for all of our, 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 our uh, population until they're 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. Until your teeth come in, we'll do orthodontics free. Then when you get all your teeth in, now you have to go outside the system to the National Health Service, for example, or some of these other countries. So. The real difference between extractions in Europe and England and other places and here in North America is that they didn't have availability of fixed appliances. All they had were removable appliances. So go back to what I said earlier. If all you have is a removable appliance, you can't do extractions. You can't bodily move teeth through bone with removable appliances. Same thing with Invisalign. So you, your, your inadequacy of techniques and skill and training dictated the treatment plan. It was asked backwards. Now that's changed a lot because people like me and many others have gone to Europe, given their courses. Now you'll find that in France, there's a significant percentage of people who treat orthodontic cases like the North Americans do. They're doing extractions now. But before, they didn't have the education, they didn't have the tools, they didn't have the know-how. Everybody became an extraction, a non-extraction case, which sounds kind of like where you go if you got Invisalign or Six Months Smiles or all that other stuff, doesn't it? Yeah, Richard, I um, only got you for eight minutes left. I'm going to throw a barrage of questions at you, um, okay. the most controversial. <clears throat> when you go in downtown, occlusion is kind of like religion. I mean, you're either, you know, Yahweh, Jesus, Allah, <laughs> Buddha. It's, uh, there's neuromuscular. There's Panky Dawson. Um, I'm just going to throw things at you. Thing. Um, a lot of them, um, Dennis, say, well, you know what, Richard? When, when people chew, their teeth don't even touch. Some people with orthodontists say, um, orthodontists all blow out the curve of speed, the curve of Wilson, you know. Um, there, so you have everything from a dogmatic religious, and it has to be neuromuscular, it has to be Panky Dawson, or and then you got other people just that they say occlusion doesn't even matter. Teeth don't even touch when you eat. Tell, tell, tell us your thoughts. I mean, you got 50 years of wisdom on occlusion. How much of this is voodoo, and how much of this is science? Uh, that's a really good question. I'm not sure I can answer that in eight minutes, but let me tell no, you. No, no, take take your time. This is Saturday, man. Take your time. I would I would I would talk to you for forty point. days and forty nights. <laughs> very good point. I believe that there are certain fundamental principles of occlusion that have an impact functionally on us. But I also believe that in when you're talking about TMD problems or myofascial pain or some of the other issues that have been blamed on occlusion, there's no relationship whatsoever. So that in some respects. There have been studies by McNamara and Seligman at the University of Michigan did a study to show that the incidence of TMD is only 10% of the input has anything to do with teeth. Most of it comes from other issues altogether. So I think occlusion has been overly blamed or uh, not just blamed, but given credit for having significant more impact than it has. I believe that since we have to have some kind of target to make things fit together and we have some basic level of biology, that there are certain fundamental principles you need. And I go back to D'Amico's theories about CO and, CO and CR should be in harmony. There's an envelope of motion which Pacelt described that I have to be able to get into and out of CO and CR without major interferences. That's at least a target for me, okay? CO and CR in harmony. 
You have to be able to get into and out of without balancing interferences or other interferences. But thousands and thousands of people don't have CO and CR in harmony and function fine. Thousands and thousands of people have uh, interferences between CO and CR and function fine. And then some people with 120 anatomical perfect contacts and a normal functioning joint have TMD. So I, I really, I'm, I'm giving you a, a broad circuitous answer to your question is I believe we have to follow some basic principles of, of occlusion, but I think that those who, who throw uh, occlusion as the primary factor in this, this whole equation are, are, are way off base. And I've taken a lot of occlusal courses. The, the person I listened to who was probably the most common sense person that I ever heard was Peter Dawson. And Peter Dawson was a prosthodontist. He was a lab technician before that. He was very articulator oriented and he came at occlusion from a, a functional but a mechanical, mechanical standpoint. But he thought and understood it like an orthodontist. When you start talking to me about neuromuscular dentistry and, and, and myomonitors and TENS units and all this other stuff, they have some place in, in physical therapy and stuff like that. But I remember years ago I sat in a class with uh, one of the early pioneers in uh, the Mayo Monitor. And he, we had 25 or 30 people in the class, all of us orthodontists. And he put Mayo Monitors on all of us. And there were, before we did this, he asked how many people in this, in this room, 25 or 30 people, how many of you have TMD symptoms or any functional occlusal symptoms? Maybe one or two people raised their hands. Probably some had other symptoms, but they didn't even consider them symptoms. But so everybody was pretty normally functioning. And he put this myo monitors on everybody, and everybody's condyles came down and forward about a millimeter, millimeter and a half, which was the neuromuscularly determined forward position. Now, if you go to LVI, then you're going to start treating people to that position. So you're taking 25 people who don't have a problem, you're rec recreating a neuromuscularly determined artificial position and calling that home. That's a house of cards, Howard, that started to collapse already, but it, it's a foolish way to approach orthodontics. I have. When people start selling neuromuscular dentistry, uh, that my eyes roll back in my head, and that's witchcraft and voodoo to me. CO and CR must be in harmony. You should be able, and, and again, I shouldn't say must be. That's the wrong way of saying it. Should be in harmony because you have to have some starting point. But again, there are lots of people who have interferences, who have balancing interferences, who don't have harmony between the two and don't have a functional problem. But we should have some starting point to go towards. So I believe my goals from an occlusal standpoint are CO and CR in harmony, lack of interference between CO and CR, canine disclusion, disclusion, and as close to incisal guidance as I can get. And I say that with respect for the restorative dentist who has much better control over the size, the length, and the shape of teeth than we do in orthodontics. We can't always get ideal incisal guidance just mechanically, it's not possible, but I strive for those things. Canine guidance, CO, CR, and harmony, no interferences, and incisal guidance where possible. That's my theory. Now here's a weird follow-up question. Okay. In America, what percent of orthodontics done today do you believe is really just cosmetics? Oh, uh, well, I'm not sure how you mean that question. Let me answer it in two ways. I say to people who take my course, and I say to anybody uh, personally that I'm at a table talking with, and they ask me about orthodontics, 95% of what I do is cosmetic dentistry. When you talk about a cosmetic dentist, which obviously there is no such thing as that specialty, or there's a cat in your face. There. It's so funny. Whenever I do a podcast <laughs> and I'm not paying attention to Mamibi, she has to jump up on my desk and get my face face. She's basically I saying, she wanted, to hear, she wanted to hear what I had to say. She's basically saying, quit talking to that other ape and talk to your cat. When, when you hear the term cosmetic dentistry, and, and it's obviously it's very popular, to, even though it's not an, a, an ADA recognized specialty, it's a very popular group of people and they call themselves cosmetic dentists. I believe orthodontics is the ultimate in cosmetic dentistry because basically that's all it is. People can function fine without ideal occlusion. People can, they come to orthodontics for aesthetic improvement. I am a cosmetic dentist. I don't save lives. I don't save TMDs. I don't save traumatic injury. I am a cosmetic dentist. Now, if you give me certain things like functional shifts on little kids, we have clear-cut evidence that an uh, occlusion with a functional shift on a little kid can lead to detrimental problems in joint failure. But class two, class three, open bite, deep bite, um, interferences, none of those things have shown any data that suggests that a poor occlusion causes trauma, breakdown, or pain. Because you have just as many people with TMJ symptoms who have a perfect occlusion or a normal occlusion as you do with a malocclusion. And that's data proven. So um, okay. I think oh, I forgot okay. your question. Oh, okay. If 95% if is cosmetic dentist, but, but the other 5% is other things like this functional shift, Spend right. a little more time explaining what a functional shift is. So my, well, 
So when so the little kid bites together, if they have an interference, and sometimes that interference can be a, a, a primary canine, or they had a finger habit and they've caused some constriction to their maxillary arch. So when they close together, their teeth hit contact point to contact point on a cusp tip. It sends a message back to your brain that says, ouch, don't bite there. So they shift their jaw off to one side and they'll get a crossbite on one side, the midline moves over to one side, but the other side is in normal relationship. They do that for comfort purposes because the premature contact, contact triggered a movement that would allow their teeth to get together without interference and discomfort. If you leave that alone long enough, you'll get asymmetrical growth of a condyle. You actually can get facial asymmetry. You can get their studies to show that of all the things we looked at, the nature of different occlusions, class one, class two, class three, open bite, deep bite, crossbite, the only one that has increased risk of causing functional breakdown later is a functional shift at a crossbite, where a youngster will hit, slide off to one side, and their one condyle is down out of the fossa, the other is in the fossa, and they may function fine. They're not in any major discomfort. But if you leave that like that over a long enough period of time, they can get some pathologic side effects. Okay. So when I talk to patients, they ask me, I get this all the time, Howard. Patients come in and say, and they're wringing their hands. They're concerned because their little kid has a couple of crooked teeth or cuspids blocked out or something. And their question always is, does my child need orthodontics? What they're really saying is, do I really have to spend $6,000 to fix that crooked tooth? But they ask, does my child need orthodontics? And my answer always is, nobody needs orthodontics. It is an elective procedure. There are many benefits to it, but they're mostly cosmetic. There are some small percentage of patients that may need orthodontics from a functional standpoint, but mostly it's an elective process. And, and, and help, help my dentist listen, answer another question mom always asks. Uh, um, you know, the balancing mental health from the binky sucking the thumb versus dental health. When, you know, if, if it may, I, I raised four kids. I, one of them was a thumb sucker, and I never wanted to stop it because it just – it was he just loved it. You know what I mean? I mean, he could be all sure. stressed out. The minute he threw his thumb in his mouth, he was as happy as, you know, having, having a beer or something. Um, <laughs> when, 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 when do we got to stop uh, comforting the mental health of sucking on a thumb or a binky or a pacifier and yeah. go to dental health? Good point, too. They, sucking, sucking is a normal thing for an infant. The suckling needs are there, whether it's their thumb or a breast or a finger or something else. So suckling is normal. And even thumb sucking is not a problem unless it starts to cause dental or dental alveolar or, or skeletal changes in the child. At that point in time, and it could be even on a five-year-old. It could be on, but if you start seeing on an 11, 12-year-old, I see kids who suck their thumb at 11, 12 years of age, and you would never know it by looking in their mouth because sucking they're sucking your thumb and they're sucking your thumb and it's the the extreme degree of force that you put on your teeth it's individual resistance to deformation there's a lot of factors so my answer to your question is if you start to see dental or dental alveolar alterations that could cause functional shifts or interferences or aesthetic issues like an open bite then maybe it's time to intervene but we have data to show that there are lots of kids when you get them to stop sucking their thumb they develop some other problem like bedwetting so there is a mental issue here that you have to deal with and maybe there's, uh, there's, you know, it's kind of hard to say this to a patient, but maybe there we ought to be involving a psychologist in dealing with this problem because you can trigger other side effects by taking away the suckling satisfaction they get from finger sucking. And, and, uh, and, and one other thing, you know, when I talk about need for orthodontics, a lot of people, I said that they need, you know, we, we were taught the BMW, the biological minimum width. And, and I, I've seen it for 30 years where when adults only have like a half millimeter of bone in between their lower incisors, it just, it just seems like they have less we're more prone to gum disease. And when those uh, lower anteriors are straight, it seems that there's less gum disease. Is that science-backed or is that just no, my... It's not science. In fact, it's, the contrary exists. Uh, and I hear that a lot when people say, I mean, it seems to me, and I can't argue with anybody who says it seems to me. I used to hear somebody say, it seems to me that people with a deep bite get more TMD, or it seems to me that people with crowding get more periodontal disease, or it's harder to keep your teeth clean when you have crowding. But when you look at large epidemiologic studies to show large samples of people, People with crowding don't have any greater incidence of periodontal disease than people without crowding. That's not an issue. It's either bacterial or it's systemic or it's some other incidence. Now, is it? could there be certain instances where people have crowding and they can't get in there and they don't floss and they can't get it clean? Yeah, there could be local areas where maybe a localized periodontal problem is because you can't get access to it or there's a papilla that's resorbed or stuff like that. But generally speaking, look, we go back and periodontists used to blame orthodontists for causing periodontal disease. That's not true either. There's no data to show malocclusion increases the risk of periodontal disease. Crowding doesn't increase the risk of periodontal disease. 
Uh, malocclusion doesn't increase the risk of, of TMD problems. No, it's a separate, isolated entity. And malocclusion in itself isn't even really a disease process, if you think about it. It's variations on normal. It's not really considered pathology. So my answer to your question is no, there's no correlation between, generally speaking, between crowding and periodontal disease. So, so if you're listening, you're, you're, you're talking about 8,000 dentists right now. And the, the bottom line is, I mean, for forty nine ninety five, you get your money back with one case. I mean, if you're listening Absolutely. to this, how the hell could you not do one case? I mean, Richard, I Rick, Richard Litt is a one patient return on investment. I mean, you listen to his 20 hours, and my God, you, you do one case, and you made it back. And then if you want more and hands-on, uh, the guy is so amazing. He credits it all to the hands-on course. Um, R R Richard, I, I just think you're – I mean, you, you are so amazing. Uh, I, I loved all of your lectures, uh, everything. Um, I, I also, the homies might be thinking, um, if they take your course, it, it is, um, you know, like implants. Or if you go to the uh, – Cologne, there's 275 companies selling titanium implants. Sure. When you do ortho, um, how, how many different companies sell ortho bands and brackets? Yeah, there's a lot of them. There's probably 15 or 20 major companies and maybe some smaller ones. But you, you mentioned the 49.95, and you can get it back in one case. I don't want to mislead anybody. The 49.95, if you want to do it, I think it's an outstanding way to get started. And, and you can take our online course at Force Online, Force INT. Now, after you take that course, you still need product. So you're going to have to spend several thousand dollars to have the products be able to deliver orthodontic treatment. You're going to make a minimum of eight to ten thousand dollar investment. So it's two cases. That's why I'm trying to say rather than one. You get that back in the first two cases that you start. We also, I don't, I'm not naive enough to think that I can get you where you need to go by talking to you for 20 hours on the internet. We offer other opportunities like online study groups, like local study groups in cities across the U.S. and Canada. I have a consultation service over the internet where I get, I've done. 15,000 cases over the internet where people send me their records. I make a diagnosis and a treatment plan and send them back their cases. I can teach you orthodontics without ever meeting you because of what you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, technology. But, let me, but, one, but, one more, but, just, but, but, let me but, reiterate this. Howard, let me make sure everybody understands this. If, you, if somebody's looking for us, it's www.forceint.com. And, but but go along with the product. I mean, do you when, when they follow you or do you are you agnostic to any ortho system or or is your course do you use like Ormco or self lighting I, I from primarily or? Use, I primarily use Ormco product. Um, there are a lot of companies that will come after these people and try and sell them product. I believe that uh, most of the major supply companies have a quality product, but I have worked with closely with Ormco Corporation over the last. 20 years which there is owned products, which is owned by Kerr. you can't get from from one corporation so we have a supply list that involves products from many different corporations but again you can do good orthodontics wherever you buy your product can you email that list to my son ryan at dentaltown.com and we'll put that in the note notes okay the list of of uh, people so, we work with come, yeah sure yeah. yeah um do you um another do do you, do you like CBCTs for ortho, or are you still just a pan Ceph man? Do, do you think, no, uh, I think CBCTs? I love CBCTs. It, it's a beautiful tool. I mean, uh, Lyle Johnson wrote a classic article a number of years ago. It's an, an incredible technology looking for a purpose. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome in, in orthognathic surgery and in implantology. We still haven't found any good uses for it in, in uh, orthodontics. But there's some. The major area... <clears throat> is in the localization of impacted canines. So you see how close that canine is to the lingual surface of upper laterals or, or centrals. But, it, it, you know, you, it's being sold. It's being used. Um, orthodontists aren't jumping on that bandwagon very much because we haven't seen a return on that investment. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference yet in orthodontics. Will it in the future? Maybe so. But damn, dentists love to raise their overhead. I mean, anytime they get a chance <laughs> to spend $100,000 on a shiny object, they just can't resist. Isn't that the truth? And I always tell him, it, I always tell him, if the alternative was a Porsche, then buy your Porsche for your office. But you, nobody needs a Porsche, nobody needs a Ferrari, but they just always believe they got to have a CAD CAM, a CBCT, a laser, and then you give them a list of a thousand millionaire dentists that don't have any of this stuff, and they, they, they're Absolute, confused. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Okay, buddy. Uh, seriously, I think you're uh, one of the um, legends of dentistry. If they, if they had a Dental Hall of Fame, I'd nominate you first. You're just a hell of a guy. Uh, it was great seeing you last time for dinner when you were in Phoenix. 
Uh, if you're ever in town again, if you ever need a baggage man to uh, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, that, that is the coolest. City. Is that your favorite like, place to teach? Like, yeah, one of my favorites. Like, you need another job, right? But whenever I'm in Phoenix, I'm going to give you a holler. We'll have dinner again. If, if, you, you. if you had to pick between uh, giving a lecture in San Juan, Puerto Rico, or Paris, France, which one would it be? I'm going to Paris every time. Yeah, that is that is the classiest call. I spent a lot of time. I spent 10 years in France four or five times a year for, in the 70s and the 80s. So I have a second home there. I'm biased. But Puerto you have Rico's, a second home there? Not really, literally. I don't mean literally. I don't own a home there. It feels like a second home to me. Oh, yeah. yeah I have Paris. a lot of friends and a lot of friends over there and some of the best years of my life. It actually was a wonderful part of my own education because I learned a lot about uh, European dentistry and international attitudes about dentistry and orthodontics in particular and that's, makes, it really, makes you realize how lucky we are to live in this country. And that's the mother of dentistry. That's Pierre Fichard. I mean, didn't it all yeah, start Pierre in Fichard, Paris? Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, hey, thank you so much for spending an hour with me today.